how to act in battle. We give the general idea, we direct them to the combat zone, and once they acquire the target with their radars, they are free to decide how to attack the target. The freedom of choice and freedom of decision, that's the name of the game, and so we train our pilots. After three years of intense training, after seeing nine out of ten of their classmates wash out, they finally graduate. From this select group of young men will arise future generals of the Air Force and leaders of the state, but only a few will enter the elite ranks of the most privileged class in Israel, the F-15 fighter squadrons of the IAF. McDonnell Douglas aircraft they hope to fly is state-of-the-art with a combat range of 1200 miles and a ceiling of 65,000 feet the Eagle can travel at two and a half times the speed of sound when it comes to the F-15 I would say I have like a if with the F-4 I have more like memories, some friends uh, who never got back from, from the battlefield and things like that. It comes to the F-15 and everything is glory and success and victory without any failures. And, you know, like you jump into an airplane. By the time you're in the airplane, you take off. You know that uh, at the area where you are, you have superiority. And again, it's a connection between you and the airplane. You come from a group of pilots which considered as the best, and I think that they are good. And you fly the airplane, which is the best in the world, and it's a good teaming altogether. So if I go by an F-15, my smile, and I think, wow, oh, this was a good teaming. And if I go by an F-4, I think, wow, this was a tough mission. The F-15 is Israel's premier aerial platform, but its workhorse is the F-4 Phantom. Phantoms arrived in the Middle East in 1969 and first saw combat fighting Egyptian MiGs over the Sinai in the war of attrition that lasted from 1969 to 1970. In July of 1970, Phantoms took part in one of the most renowned engagements of that war. Ten years later, during peace talks in Washington, D.C., the Israelis listened as Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, himself a former MiG pilot, reminisced about the air battle in which Soviet MiG-21 advisors, who had criticized their Egyptian students, were finally allowed to fly against the Israelis. Mr. Mubarak is telling us, look, we let them fly, and one day you shot down five Russians over southern Egypt, which is true. This is what we did. The same evening, all the bases of the Egyptian Air Force in the bars, the pilot was celebrating the victory of the Israelis over the Egyptians. And I'm talking about the war of attrition. <laughs> Egyptian benevolence and Israeli air superiority would not last long. By 1973, leaders in Cairo were preparing new plans and new weapons for the final battle. One that would wipe out a third of the Israeli air force and nearly crush the life out of the Jewish state. By the spring of 1980, it is a daily event. F-15 Eagles patrol the nation's northern border to stand vigil against marauding Syrian warplanes. But the frontier stretches for miles and the settlements along it are never totally immune to attack. Soon, war calls once again on the nation of Israel. This time, the focus is on the northern border with Lebanon. Here, Palestinian guerrillas, intent on regaining their homeland, have attacked several kibbutzim on the frontier. In April of 1980, 
PLO terror squads make their way onto the Mizgavam kibbutz. Here, several children are held hostage, and one is subsequently killed. This is followed by months of rocket attacks that by June of 1982, finally pushed the Israeli government to launch an invasion some had seen coming for over a year. In 1981, there was a spate of attacks by the PLO from southern Lebanon on northern Israel. One element or one result of those attacks was something that the Israeli military censor would not allow to be published and would not allow foreign correspondents to report. And that was that Israelis were fleeing from the northern town of Metula because it was too dangerous to live there. In the Israeli ideology, which existed since the building of the state, the notion that Jews would retreat from territory they had settled was simply anathema and unacceptable. Initially, the war in Lebanon is fought almost entirely between Israeli ground units and PLO militia. Israeli warplanes are limited to air-to-ground assaults, which they engage in with ferocious determination. F-4s, Skyhawks, and F-16s take on the bulk of the work as F-15s fly MiG-CAP missions overhead. Syria occupies nearly half of Lebanon. At first, they warily accept Israel's claim that the invasion is meant to carve out a 40-mile buffer zone in southern Lebanon and nothing more. PLO defenses are spirited, but hopelessly outgunned, and soon swept away. As Israeli columns close in on the Beirut-Damascus highway, the true objectives of the invasion are revealed. Not only to destroy the PLO, but also establish a Christian puppet state in Lebanon, eliminating Syria as a power broker in the region. Leaders in Damascus find it an intolerable proposition. Once Israeli forces pass beyond the 40-mile security zone, F-15 pilots prepare themselves for the coming conflict with Syria that many now see as inevitable. Both sides prepare for an aerial showdown. The world tenses in the face of a volatile Middle East brush fire. scale war between a Soviet client state and an American ally in such a critical region could easily spread. For young Israeli pilots, there is no such apprehension. It is a moment they've waited for all of their lives. You're making so much training and you invest so much uh, money and so much effort. And I don't know if it's right to make the comparison, but in some sense it's like Olympics. We want to gain the medal, the gold medal, not the silver medal and not the bronze medal. And that's the way we trained our pilot and that's the way that they behave. When Syrian armor crashes into lead Israeli forces in the Bekaa Valley, the need for IAF air-to-ground support becomes acute. columns of Israeli troops find themselves on the verge of being wiped out. Suddenly, Air Force commanders face a repeat of the Sinai in 1973. Throughout the Bekaa Valley, the Syrians have placed advanced surface-to-air missile batteries similar to those that decimated the IAF nearly 10 years ago. We couldn't have done this under the umbrella of the sand batteries because, again, we would have lost uh, many aircraft. So there was no other